We talk about the arms race, you know, big bombs and big things that could kill people. And they're very dangerous, and we don't ever want those out there. But you know, the majority of people in the world are killed from small arms fire. In the last two decades, the DEA has definitely witnessed a large-scale convergence of weapons trafficking and terrorism. At least 60 people are confirmed dead in uh, what is clearly a Paris terror attack, gunfire, AK-47s in multiple parts of the French capital. An arms dealer doesn't care who he sold the weapons to or what they were going to use them for, as long as they were able to make him a profit. When you're providing weapons to terrorist organizations, there's nothing worse than that. The people doing it are horrible people. And if we don't do something about it, we could lose thousands and thousands of lives. But to try to lock up an international arms trafficker, you know, you're dancing with the devil. As a former FBI agent and chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, I had oversight of all 16 of our nation's intelligence agencies. My name is Mike Rogers. I had access to classified information gathered by our operatives, people who risked everything for the United States and our families. You don't know their faces or their names. You don't know the real stories from the people who lived the fear and the pressure until now. In the late 70s through the 80s into the 90s, all around the world, we had to do a proxy wars. I mean, Lebanon was raging. There were conflicts throughout Africa. The Iran-Iraq war, the breakup of Yugoslavia, the breakup of East Czechoslovakia, those all occurred because someone was willing to sell them weapons. They created havoc. Millions of people were killed. If you're one of the top gray and black arms dealers in the world, you can make fortunes by distributing weapons to whatever cause you want to make money on. They're businessmen. They don't necessarily have a lot of rules like you and I do, but they run a business. Manzar al Qasar was one of the most elite global weapons traffickers. He's really responsible for a lot of the modern-day armed conflict throughout the world. He started back in the 70s stealing cars, moving small amounts of drugs, until he became this international hash heroin trafficker who then blossomed into one of the top five weapons traffickers in the world. He thought he was untouchable. His nickname was the Proud Peacock. You know, this, this is my house, this is my palace. That estate had a shamrock pool, tennis courts, basketball courts, three large floors. It had the elements of lifestyles of the rich and famous and a Bond movie. He actually had a small dog that he would carry around the compound. You can't make it up. He was so rich, some people called him the prince, but few would mistake him for royalty. He developed relationships with ambassadors, intelligence agencies, security forces, all in an effort to be able to do what he wants to do and influence who he needs to influence. And he's one way or another responsible for hundreds of deaths with the weapons and arms that he's provided terrorist organizations. Anybody that ever had any business with him will tell you he's a despicable person. This is the highest evolution of a criminal that you could find. Sherlock Holmes has his arch nemesis, Moriarty, you know? He was kind of the Moriarty for me. I mean, he was. He was one of those guys that got away. I was 19 when I came in as an intern, and other than being a cop for a few years, I've been with DEA ever since. I haven't done anything else other than, than really being a DEA agent. <laughs> Munzer started surfacing in DA reporting in the early 70s. But what happened was, in the early 80s, when I was a young agent in New York, running around New York, we started realizing we had a major problem in the United States, the drug trade. Heroin, 
the most destructive narcotic man has ever devised. This has reached epidemic proportions. New York was a gateway city for heroin. That's when Munzer first pops up. In 1984, I was working a case on some Middle Eastern traffickers. At the culmination of the case, we seized a lot of heroin, we arrested a lot of people, and every one of them said, I want to tell you a story, and they talked about Munzer. What I learned over that period of time was Munzer's organization was moving drugs to the United States, but Munzer realized the infrastructure to move arms and drugs at that time were essentially the same. And he had a very good ability to move stuff through cargo ships. So it was easy. He was able to get himself in the gray arms business. He could provide arms, especially small arms. To Africa, he provided weapons to Somalia. Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North devised a scheme to finance the Contras by overcharging Iran for the weapons. The Iran Contra, he not only supplied weapons to the Iranians, but he also then turned around and supplied small arms for the Contras. The Iran-Iraq War, he provided weapons to both sides. October 1985. Munzer al Kasak he had aligned himself with the Palestinian dissident groups. The Palestinian Liberation Front wanted to pirate the Italian cruise liner Achille Lauro, take passengers hostage so they can negotiate with the Israeli government to release one of their fighters. Munzer was the supplier of the weapons. He brought the weapons from Poland and turned it over to the fighters. Palestinian terrorists have hijacked an Italian cruise liner in the Mediterranean and are threatening to start executing American passengers. Four Palestinian fighters separated the Americans and Jewish passengers from all the other passengers. Marilyn and Leon Klinghoffer, a Jewish family from New York, um, were on, on, on the vessel. At one point, they were telling people that they were going to start killing passengers if they didn't get a safe place to bring the boat in. During the course of the negotiations, the fighters actually took Leon Klinghoffer, who's wheelchair bound, shot him and threw him into the Mediterranean. Eventually, they got a safe place to bring the boat in. The fighters got off the vessel, the hostages were released, the fighters got on the plane, they flew out. They got away. He provided the logistics for the hijacking of the ship and provided the weapons. How could you be any more involved? And how could you not be considered a terrorist if you're one of the top arms dealers in the world? Those terrorists killed an American and threw him off a ship. And nobody could touch him. Munzer was a global criminal. He lived in one place. He bought things from one other place. He sent them to a third place that ended up in the fourth place and none of the countries had jurisdiction over them. To be successful in going after a global criminal, you need to have a perfect understanding of how we function. The question was never, should he be indicted? The question was, could we get close enough to indict him? After the pirating of the Achilles Laurel, Munzo al Kassar kept on surfacing. He continued supporting terrorism around the world. And because I was working heroin for the longest time in New York, and the heroin would go from the Middle East into either Italy or France, I'd get transferred to Paris. That was in 1988. I'm sitting in my office, and I started thinking, I need to get him. But we didn't have the case that we could prove against al Hassan. I said, well, there's a lot more we know of what Munzer did, but what could we prove? I wanted to gather as much as I could on the guy. Of course, I talked to the Interpol people constantly. His name would pop up. They all knew him, and they all knew he was a major trafficker and a terrorist. People who had access to Munzer's properties gave us documents and a lot of good information about him. As we reviewed the documents, we could show that Munzer was very much involved with all these Palestinian terrorist groups. He supplied the weapons for the pirating of the Achilles Laurel. We know that 
he helped finance it because there were movements of money in his accounts. So we were probing him, we were hitting him. We were locking up people that were part of his organization, at least in Europe, and I felt that we got to be pretty close to make a case against al Qasab. At that time, my oldest daughter uh, was born in Paris. After she's born, I leave the hospital to go get some flowers. A very well-dressed uh, Middle Eastern man pops out, and he says, Mr. Jim, Mr. Jim. When I looked at him, I knew who he was. He was al Qasab's driver when al Qasab came to Paris. Why does he know who I am? He says, Mr. al Qasab would like to congratulate you on the birth of your daughter. Now, my daughter was probably born maybe six hours earlier. They knew. They knew she had been born. In the 80s, his organization was moving drugs to the United States. But then his arms business took off. He was living in Marbella, Spain. He made lots of money. This guy's walking around in his palatial estate. He made his living off the ills of other people. I mean, he, he created so much havoc. You know, someone had to do something about it. And so the Spanish arrested El Casar for the pirating of the Achilles law. Because of me having gone through a long period of time and working this investigation, they asked me to testify in trial in Madrid. I sat two people away from him. Literally, I could reach out and touch him. Several members of his organization that were going to testify, two of them were killed. One of them, his kids were kidnapped. Eventually, he gets killed too. And a very critical witness changed his story. So he was acquitted of that charge. We tried, but he was a very treacherous guy. Nothing stuck to him. Once you hear that he was responsible for the deaths of many people, you can't, like, say, well, that doesn't matter. I didn't think we'd get another opportunity at that point. I really so didn't. So after the Spanish trial, you did not think you'd have another opportunity? No. no. Part of the problem was U.S. laws stated that people who would operate between international boundaries, like Mons or Alcazar, were unable to be prosecuted. Even in our own country, people didn't understand, you know, if the bombs are going off in, in France or Germany, or, it didn't really affect us in the United States so much. It wasn't until 9-11 that we actually realized that we're all connected, absolutely. In a few moments, I'll be signing the USA Patriot Improvement and Reauthorization Act. This is a really important piece of legislation. It is a piece of legislation that's vital uh, to win the war on terror and to protect the American people. So there were new laws that were created that allow the United States government to pursue extraterritorial targets who reside outside the United States and prosecute them within the United States. We as a country have to send some kind of message that if you're gonna commit crimes against Americans, you're gonna face some kind of charges. The Special Operations Division at DEA was developed to help a group of senior investigators enforce the laws. In Special Operations, they developed the Bilateral Investigative Unit to specifically go out and touch the untouchables. So we went out and targeted those individuals that were operating outside the United States that affected the United States. So by 2006, we had new laws on the books, and we get the opportunity to do a case like this on a lifelong criminal and terrorist that nobody's ever been able to touch. Our role as the team was to come up with a game plan by hook or by crook, we're gonna make a case, find out what Monzer is doing, and find a way to prosecute him. Our role as the team was to come up with a game plan by hook or by crook, we're gonna make a case, find out what Monzer is doing, and find a way to prosecute him. 
I think the first challenge with a terrorist is how do we get close? The DEA would work with our local counterparts and develop sources of information. And working with sources was a very large part of DEA success worldwide. And you can't really make a good case if you don't have a good source. And in this particular case, we're talking about a terrorist in another country with associates all over the world. He definitely was cautious on who would get close and who he would talk to. So how do we find a source that can get to this inner circle? Jim had a relationship with a high-level source that had been utilized by the DEA for approximately 20 years. His name was Samir. In New York, in the early 1980s, Jim arrested Samir for narcotics trafficking. We arrested him, and I knew he was pretty important. He was Palestinian by birth, well-educated, well-read, multilingual, phenomenally bright. I knew he would be useful because he understood the global criminal networks. As a source, he had the capabilities of following through. I first met Samir in 84, early 85. Back in them days, we could pull a prisoner out to interview them, but he never said anything, and I used to eat my lunch in front of him. I used to buy the kebab sandwiches and stuff right before I walked in there so you could smell the food, you know. I'd always brought enough for two. I said, would you like some? He wouldn't say anything, he just said to him. After like, I don't know, several of these things, he finally said to me, what do you want from me? I told him, I want you to cooperate. I'm, we need information on traffickers. So that's when I first started working with him. And then over the years, we just, you know, we worked on a lot of different projects together. We were looking to develop a weakness within Monzer's organization. Samir's job was to broker a meeting with Monzer, but there were a number of steps that had to happen first. If Monzer's the hub of the wheel, the spokes are close associates that Monzer had developed in his criminal activities. One of those spokes was in Beirut, Lebanon. Tarek Al Ghazi had a long history of arms trafficking in Poland with Manzer Al Qasar. Samir needed to penetrate his inner circle by establishing a relationship with Tarek Al Ghazi and eventually set up a meeting with Manzer Al Qasar. At this point, I've been working with Samir for a lot of years. I said, Do you understand if you decide to do this, that your life will change forever? It'll never be the same again. He said, I'll do it. I said, no. I made him sleep on it. Go, come back tomorrow, let's talk tomorrow. Kassar would not take it lightly, and we're not in the business of getting anybody hurt. So, in Beirut, Lebanon, our confidential source, Samir, was able to meet Tarek Al Ghazi, develop a relationship over the course of approximately one year. He was able to gain Al Ghazi's trust. And eventually, Samir asked the million dollar question, which is, can you get a weapons deal with Manzar al Ghazar for me? Criminals are always cautious because the DEA has built a large human intelligence network. So it was extremely hard to set up a meeting with Manzar al Ghazar. But eventually, he was successful in being able to do that. But Samir came to us in July of 2006 and stated that Monzer had requested that an end user certificate be provided before he would meet with us. We knew that it could potentially be a problem. In the arms trafficking world, in order to make a weapons transaction legitimate, it starts with an end user certificate. An end user certificate is a document produced by a country or military or police force that states that the items listed on the certificate are for their sole use and that these goods would not be resold to a third party. Monzer could show this certificate and say, I was acting in good faith in conducting this transaction. 
We came up with a few countries that would be likely candidates who could produce an end user certificate for us. Our office in Managua had a great working relationship with the Nicaraguan officials. So I went down to Nicaragua in July of 2006. Our DEA office there set up a meeting for me to meet with the generals. It was an older building. It didn't even have electricity. We met in a dark candlelit room. A bunch of generals were seated around a large table and all I could make out was brief outlines of faces through the cigar smoke. I went over what we were looking for, what weapons we were looking to put on the end user certificate, sniper rifles, RPG-7 grenade launchers, surface-to-air missiles, and asked for their assistance. So along with the certificate, what the Nicaraguans were able to do is provide a telephone that someone could later call, meaning Monzer or one of his associates, in order to verify the authenticity of the end user certificate that came out in Nicaragua. Once Monzer received the end user certificate from Tariq, he agreed to a meeting in Beirut, Lebanon in December of 2006. The DEA had been investigating Monzer Alcazar since its inception in the 1970s. Now we had a chance to arrest him and convict him and be able to keep him behind bars. And the way that we had set this deal up was just strange enough to be believable. Monzer agreed to a meeting with Tariq and Samir in Beirut, Lebanon in December of 2006. And the way that we had set this deal up was just strange enough to be believable. In order to build the investigation against Monzer, we had to catch him right-handed. To infiltrate a terrorist organization, you go after them with great sources. I had just finished working an investigation in Guatemala where I had some pretty high-level sources, Carlos and Luis. So the plan was to introduce my sources as potential buyers. We wanted to have my two sources played roles as, as FARC members. The FARC is a guerrilla group that transitioned into a terrorist organization that is deeply rooted in the Colombian cocaine trade. The FARC is in opposition of the Colombian government and those governments that are supporting it. So with the scenario that we put together, the FARC needed these weapons to shoot down American helicopters. When you look at Monger, he's a financial guy and he's looking about doing it for money, but there was a big interest to be in opposition against the United States. So Samir met with Monzer and Tariq in Beirut, Lebanon. We needed Samir to develop sufficient trust with Monzer in order to convince him to meet our sources. Going into a situation with any source, it's a very dangerous activity for them. Alcazar had to believe the sources were legitimate bad guys that were looking to do a legitimate transaction for weapons. In any first meeting that takes place between uh, bad guy and bad guy, uh, there's always a testing. It's to know how knowledgeable the person is about what they're doing, whether it's to find out are they working for the government, or two, do they really know what they're doing and how can I get one over on them? Once Samir had established his credentials with Monzer in Beirut, Monzer invited Luis and Carlos to his residence in Marbella, Spain. But 
the dicey part came is when he actually took copies of their passports, right? They have to use their real identity. I mean, we couldn't afford them to come into Spain with fraudulent documents and get arrested. That adds to the layer of terror in my book that they're going there with their real identity. They're naked. Yeah, yeah. Mazar al -Kassar wanted money. You know, it's all about business. We knew we had to have money that we could wire transfer to him to show him that the informants were legitimate bad guys. Monzer stood to make 10 to 20 million dollars based off of the amounts of weapons that we were talking about. So we needed 100,000 euros as a down payment for the weapons. We had to navigate getting government money and figuring out how we were going to wire it internationally that it didn't look like it was transferred from the Fed to a bank to Monzer al -Kassar. And so our sources take the train down into Marbella while we stay in Barcelona. We knew it would be a high-risk operation. Monzer was very good at picking up something that was unusual for his normal patterns and how he operated in his criminal enterprise. And Monzer was extremely violent. People wound up dead. Once the witness became paralyzed after a missile was fired into their apartment in Lebanon, it was very dangerous for our informants. And if something had happened to them, we weren't in a position to come in and, and rescue them. This kind of operation goes against everything you've ever been taught as a cop being an undercover. You always want to meet in a neutral place and you want to have control of the situation. And here we are, we're going to have no control of the situation at all. We're just hoping that everybody can get out of there safely and come home. We had to send them with recording equipment. We needed evidence, so that was the risk that we took. We were going to show them that we were legit and that we meant to do business. So everything had to work with precision. They had to have conversations with Kassar about his weapons and ways they can assist people in killing Americans. You say, hey, look, this is where we need to be. This is the evidence we need to get. I'm going to rely on you to get us there, and hopefully they cross that line. This was the best opportunity we had to get Monzer al -Kassar. If the meeting didn't go in the right direction, we were going to lose him. As much as you'd like to think that Kassar has dropped his guard and super comfortable and buying into everything you're doing, he's the kind of bad guy that's never going to do that. We heard Monzer asking numerous questions about the FARC. He was trying to test the sources. If you're going to play in a FARC role, then you better know something about the FARC. It is a chess game. It's a game of cat and mouse. You're always walking the wire of, he's believing me. But is he really? Is he going to continue to do business with me? Or is he going to take me out back and shoot me? confidential sources were at Monzer's house. In Marbella, Spain, acquiring evidence recorded via concealed devices that were carried by Luis and Carlos. At the same time, we were in Barcelona waiting for any feedback that we could get. There was not going to be any communication from Monzer's house until they got back. But it's a game of cat and mouse. Monzer Afasar is extremely dangerous. He's both acted as a terrorist and supported terrorist organizations throughout the world. 
100 mil euros. Vamos a comenzar a depositar y a traer, por eso estamos vale, aquí. Vale, vale. Toma. You're always walking the wire of, is he going to continue to do business with me or is he going to take me out back and shoot me? The sources went in the house knowing that they had to collect evidence. And they had to have conversations with Kassar about specific weapons, what the weapons would be used for, what kind of weapons. So, you know, you can build a case. So we wanted to put a package together that would be enticing the Munzer, but also help build a case against him. AK-47s, sniper rifles, RPGs, and surface-to-air missiles. And surface-to-air missile charges are a minimum mandatory of 20 years. This is the evidence we need to get. And that's not outside the realm of believability for the FARC needing surface-to-air missiles because the you know, U.S. had helicopters down there eradicating fields but also we needed to have them discuss how the missiles could be used to shoot down American helicopters in Colombia and kill Americans. Monster knew exactly what was going on, the quantity of the weapons, what type of weapons they were, and what and what they were going to be used for. So we had great evidence because of how he talked about how his business with us could lead to American deaths. So at that point, we had a case against him. But we had to get Casar to leave Spain. Because we knew that he had contacts within the Spanish government. They look at what happened in the past. He was able to get out of a, a number of these arrests and trials. You know, is he going to walk away from this? We had to come up with reasons on why Monzer had to meet us outside of the country of Spain. So we had told Monzer that one of the highest members of the FARC was traveling specifically to meet with Monzer. And our story was that the FARC member would release the money if he personally saw Monzer and knew that Monzer was involved in the deal. We tried to set up the meeting in Romania. It was a country where the extradition process was very short and efficient and we'd done a lot of investigations with the Romanians over the years. And we were hoping that's where Monzer would be arrested. But Monzer was always cautious. Solo llamándote para, para confirmarte que si nos podemos ver el día miércoles 6 en Bucarest. Oh, en el capital, ¿sí? En la capital, correcto. At that point, we thought things were not going to go the way we were hoping, and he was resisting meeting with us or traveling. ¿Tú crees que sea muy difícil la visa para ti? Creo difícil. Tarda, tarda una semana por por menos. Monzer doesn't want to travel to Romania. So now everybody's stressed out. We had to adjust. We had to have a second plan. Plan B was for him to be arrested in Madrid, which would be much more of a challenge for us. Our fear was that Monzer's contacts were worldwide. And if someone told him about our international arrest warrants, he would find a way out of Spain without being seen. And he could get to a place that would never extradite him. We knew that what motivated Monzer Akasar was money. And we believe he had promised the arms manufacturers that this weapons deal was going to go through. So that if he wasn't able to put this deal together, he would actually be losing face. So Monzer agreed to go to Madrid to meet the FARC, who he believed had to be convinced 
by him in order to release the money that would fund the remaining part of the weapons transaction. We were able to have it confirmed that he did get on the flight. And then we were waiting for him upon arrival at uh, Madrid airport with the Spanish National Police. So we're all waiting at the airport. Everything was set up. The Spanish National Police were supposed to observe him getting off the gate. We were watching Monzer walk into the baggage claim area. And then all of a sudden, over the radio, we heard, we've lost him. So we're all waiting at the airport. We were watching Monzer getting off the gate. Then all of a sudden, over the radio, we heard, we've lost him. And we thought that he had caught on to us and that he had escaped out the side door. And then everybody got into a panic mode, running around nervous about where is he, where is he? And even the DA agents were running around in the baggage claim area trying to locate him. John and I were going from point A to point B, and then all of a sudden, here comes Monzer. He walked out of the bathroom. Once he arrived in baggage claim, the fugitive squad of the Spanish National Police put him under arrest. I'm here today to announce the arrest of international arms dealer Manzer al Qasar on charges of terrorism and arms trafficking. Yesterday's arrest marked the culmination of a long-term DEA undercover investigation that spanned the globe and finally brought one of the world's most prolific arms traffickers to justice. It was awesome that we arrested Kassar. So great feeling to know that now he's in jail based on our international arrest warrant and held in Spain. He knew that he had no control in the United States. He couldn't buy his way out. He couldn't maneuver his way out. And that was his last straw was to fight it in Spain. He had a lot of contacts in government. He was trying to bribe people, supposedly. He was threatening people. Quite honestly, I was not 100% sure we would be able to get him out of Spain. He was fighting the extradition. That, that was the only leg that he had to stand on. So he was going to take every option, make every move that he could to get out of the process. It was a little over a year before the extradition was granted. There's a formal procedure to turn over a person that's been extradited, right? You know, Interpol, Spain had to turn them over this document you have to sign. So that morning, we're told, be at the airport at this point. We didn't know what was going to happen. We said, maybe they'll change their mind, what, you know? But then all of a sudden, we hear the helicopters come. They brought him by helicopter. The helicopter lands. He thought he was being moved to another prison. And he gets off the copter. And he's shackled, and he's, he starts coming over, and he sees us all lined up with our DEA jackets. You know what I mean? And he got a little emotional. His lips started quivering. And then he, he started saying, Viva Spain, or whatever. At that point, the Spanish take off their shackles. So we shackle them and bring them onto the plane. It probably took us less than 10 minutes to be up and out, you know, because we want to get out of there. When we got on the plane, we all had our music that we intended on listening to. We were doing our own thing and watching TV. He couldn't help but want to talk to us. Monzer's personality is that he can't be ignored. So he's talking, he's, and, he, and he's, you know, he's kind of blaming Jim Soyles for everything, you know. Isn't that you? That's me. He hadn't seen me in years. He was saying, I lied, I did this, I did, you know, I'm a terrible person. All, I don't know, all the crazy things. I wasn't paying attention to any of it. I was sitting up front. I think Monza realized that his time was up, but he never changed his colors because he was still that little proud peacock, you know, when he was on the plane. Like, he was the guy that was in control, despite he had shackles on. So at one point, I get up, I got to go to the bathroom. He's ranting and raving, and Wim Brown, being the jokester that he is, he says, why don't you tell Jim Soilis that? He's right here. And he looks up at me, and I take off my glasses. He, he, he got visibly, uh, you, you. I thought he was going to have a heart attack. I said, hey, easy, Mozart. Relax. It's a long flight. Just take it easy. Shut up and watch the movie. It was the end of a long road. But at that time, we still knew that we had to successfully prosecute him in a US court. Of course, we still got to try him. Everything we've done is going to play out in court. 
Ultimately, he was charged with material support to a terrorist organization, trying to acquire service-to-air missiles, and trying to kill citizens of the United States. We went to trial in the fall of 2008, and a large part of our case was us combating his defense so that we could show what his true intent was. If his defense was he knew it wasn't a legitimate deal, why would he have ever gone through with it in the first place? Ultimately, he was found guilty on all charges. Monzer was convicted and eventually sentenced to 30 years in federal prison. After the trial, I'll tell you, that was relief, knowing that they got convicted on all the charges. You know why I was happy? Because it's important for closure for a lot of different people. He had created harm all over the place. The Klinghoffer daughters were sitting there when he got convicted. I mean, it was important to them. It sends a clear message that you can run, but you can't hide. This terrorist is finally going to be put away for 30 years, and he won't be able to plan and plot any more murders. I mean, the biggest part was the relief, because we had spent a lot of time, a lot of resources, and it was good knowing that we did it. Just, just good knowing that we did it, that we finished it. This wasn't just, you know, another drug deal. This was uh, taking a huge weapons trafficker off the playing field. This was getting Monzer Alcazar. It was to stop evil from spreading, I think. <laughs>